Hi, this is no, Talk of the Town with Mayor Sherry Cantor. Uh, this is our second Talk of the Town episode, or session, um, and I have with me today um, our police chief, yeah. our uh, Tracy Gove, our assistant police chief, Dan Coppinger, and our also assistant mm -hmm. police chief, yeah. um, uh, McHugh. So, Bob McHugh. Um, we are, this show is to educate you, to engage you, to help you become aware and, and stay on top of issues that are going on in the town. Uh, I just want to take a minute again to thank WHCTV to, for providing such a wonderful service uh, to educating, engaging our public, um, making West Hartford the special place it is. Because without WHCTV, so much of what happens in our town could not be seen by you, our viewers, and our public. Um, I also want to uh, suggest that you call me or you can email me with ideas that you have for people that you would like to hear from in your community um, and enlighten you on what's going on. Um, I also want to just say that this is, uh, I hope to be open and engaging, approachable. I have office hours every month. If you need to, if you want to come in to talk, I'm happy to, uh, I'm happy to hear from you. Um, but we're, in, we're going to proceed with our, our guests and talk about some of the things that are going on in policing, uh, not only in our community, uh, but nationally. Yeah. And uh, a lot, there, you've all heard a lot going on in, uh, in the realm of uh, public safety. Uh, and it, these are important issues, uh, and we as a town value our, the, the quality of life that we have and the fact that we have an incredible uh, police department that keeps us safe and, um, and works with us on a, on a community level, on every level, really. Um, and we're so excited to have you here to, to talk you. about oh, some you. of the issues going yeah. on. So I thought we'd start with um, the background and makeup of the department, and you could share with us sort of an overview of... Sure. Sure. So when we hold our Citizens Academy, College Academies, um, the number one question people want to know is how many police officers do you have? So we like to tell people is we're authorized for 132, mm -hmm. but we always have vacancies, so we're down officers and we're recruiting. But one thing I like to show when we talk about the police department is this graphic, and I know it's perhaps not the best graphic for TV, but this is the organizational chart of the police department. And when people think of police, typically what they think of is they think of the officer in uniform, in the marked vehicle, who stops them for a ticket, who uh, helps them in some way. But when people associate police and the police department, they think of that officer. What I like to show with this graphic, I think what's helpful here, is this the, the entire organization. Now this on top, of course, is the police chief. I like to say this is the guy with the most headaches right here. <laughs> um, he sits at the top, and then this is kind of a breakdown of the department. But that officer, that patrol officer in uniform that's on the street, that just really kind of uh, encompasses this kind of left column here. Okay, so everything over here is not that officer. So what this shows is the diversity of the police department. We do a lot more than just have the officer on patrol. We have a detective division, we have a uh, traffic division, we have a uh, animal control officer, I mean community relations division. So this really breaks it down nicely, but like I said, the, the main thrust of this is to show that there's so much more going on in the police department than just that patrol officer, and it really is a complex organization. It is, and I... Um I also have learned a lot from meeting with you and talking with you about all that goes on yeah. behind the scenes um, and uh, the training that goes on too but for the officers that you see in the ca in, in cars mm -hmm. that are labeled police cars but also maybe not labeled police cars yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. and, uh, yeah. and so much more. Um, and we live in an area, we're an inner ring suburb yep. for a city that has mm -hmm. significant uh, crime issues sure. too. And we, uh, as a council, are aware of crimes that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, it is eye-opening to understand what travels through West Hartford sure. and what we, uh, what we do, uh, what you do see right. every day mm -hmm. um, and decisions you have to make every day. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought we'd um, talk about just you know, there's so much conversation about what's going on in uh, policing today. Yeah. Uh, challenges that face you, challenges yeah. that face uh, some cities that, uh, that you know, maybe on r racial profiling sure. and Black Lives Matter, all those mm. kinds of, of topics. So I'd love you to talk about some of the things you've been doing, many of these things well before this well hit before the this. media. Exactly. Um, so. so I'll start, and if you guys want to join in, I don't mean to take over the whole conversation, but okay, so... If the viewers saw that, and I know you're aware, I went to Washington, D.C. last week or the week before to talk about 21st century policing. So if, you, if we kick back a little bit, the president put out this initiative to talk about 21st century policing, 
how we can improve police community relations. And he came out with these six pillars um, that he talked about, about transparency, technology, training, um, policy, officer wellness, and community policing. So he came out with this report and they decided to have these forums for chiefs. So I went to one and people said to me, well, what was the biggest takeaway? Well, first they said, did you meet Obama, President Obama? <laughs> and I said, no, I didn't meet the president. Um, I didn't have the opportunity. Mm -hmm. But the second question is, what did you take away from it? And the one thing I took away from it is that we were, we're so far ahead of the curve. So I'm the chief in West Hartford, so I'll say in West Hartford, but really in Connecticut and I think the Northeast, we're just so far ahead of the curve in a lot of these areas. And a lot of these programs that they, they talk about, we've already implemented. I mean, you talk about transparency. We're a very transparent agency. We have our social media. Um, we're very uh, available in the public. We're responsive to requests for um, freedom of information. In fact, I think what's interesting is even we have an operational budget that we work with, but anything outside of that, whether it's asset forfeiture money, whether it's a subsidiary account, anything we want to spend or purchase goes through a council resolution. So the council sees it and has to approve it and the public gets to see it too. So we're very transparent. Um, our training is top notch. Uh, our officers are highly educated. Uh, and we can talk about these more, more yes, detail if you we, want. I but there's, um, we've worked on policies. We've worked on our community policing. We have a myriad of programs mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that we're really proud about is we're one of the first departments that had a um, citizen review board yes. to resolve complaints. That's been in existence for over 20, 25 years now where when a citizen has a question or a concern about the way we act, um, we have a board that consists of police officers, citizen representatives, okay. corporation counsel from the town of West Hartford that looks at those, those complaints and thankfully there's very few of them and most of them resolve around a traffic ticket. That's right. um, but uh, so we've engaged the, the community here to uh, try and resolve any kind of disagreements for well over two decades. Mm -hmm. But and a lot of that is because you do outreach. We I do. mean, I mm -hmm. we have neighborhood associations right. um, <laughs> around town, and yeah. I always see there's always an officer yeah. or or one of you at those meetings to talk with businesses, to talk with neighbors about trends that are happening, whether it's break-ins of cars or things that are happening, mm -hmm. and also you know sort of global trends and, sure. and things that you have. So it's this two-way partnership, yeah. really, yeah. as being... The, the outreach is one of our greatest focuses right now. We're, we, we've tried to reach out to, and we do reach out to, our, our faith-based organizations, mm -hmm. and, and we have meetings with them. We reach out to the, our local businesses, and we're trying to partnership up with some of our, our local colleges to just have discussions. In fact, right people. now, if I can jump in, for the first time ever, um, we have a program at St. Joseph's where they're going to try to host us maybe once a month. We're not really sure on the schedule, but to have officers come in and just meet with the students and it's no formal programming. It's just talk about whatever the students want to talk about. And our first program is today from 11 to 1 at St. Uh, University of St. Joseph's. So it's a, it's a great program. That is, wow, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we've had, you know, we, we don't see too many rallies in town. Right. But when we do, they've always been peaceful. Mm -hmm. And we, before they even begin, and when we hear about them, we always reach out. We want to link up and let let everyone know that we're here for your safety. Yes. We don't want people falling out into traffic. And so when police officers are out there, we're out there for, for safety reasons. And, yeah. you know, you're, you won't see police get involved with political statements or anything like that. We're completely neutral. Mm -hmm. And we're there as representation of our community. Right. And to support the fact that people can... Have, say, their have their right, yeah, have right. their moment yep. to, to share their uh, share their beliefs. Um, so, what uh, what would you say are your biggest challenges um, within the, those pillars? Um, I know that you actually have talked a lot about, and you've brought to the council some initiatives on hiring a diverse officer mm -hmm. base. And Good. Yep. That that is a, that's certainly a challenge for us. We um, so we want our department to be reflective of our entire community. Um, and, it, and it's just not the case here. But it's not just West Hartford. This is a national trend uh, of trying to find a more diverse police department. So if I can back up, to, one of the issues we have is that when I'm in home in bed at night, 2 in the morning, I need to make sure our officers do the right thing, whether they're on a car stop, whether they're making an arrest, checking a house that may have had a burglary. I need to know they're doing the right thing. So we have to have the, the best applicants we can find, um, most ethical applicants. As part of our hiring process, which Assistant Chief McHugh has been involved in for 15 years now, maybe more, yeah. we find that only 5% of 
pass our background process mm. because it's so uh, restrictive. So it's not a matter of, of just diversifying, it's a matter of just finding folks that can pass those hurdles, that can, that'll take the test, that can pass the test, then that can pass the background. We, ha we do have some initiatives out there, though, as you know, the town council was gracious with us. We worked with them this budget year to, um, they, we were given $15,000 to work on diversity recruitment, retention, and promotion. Mm -hmm. um, we're using that money to, um, well, we're using it for some promotional processes within the police department but also a recruitment fair. We ran a recruitment fair last year, which was yeah. the idea of Assistant Chief McHugh. Uh, we got quite a, a broad base uh, of applicants from that. And in fact, I, I looked quickly before we did this recording. This year alone, we've hired six female applicants, or six female police officers, um, which is a, a significant number for us. That's, the I think, the highest all at once that you've Well, we had uh, four at right? once, and then we've hired uh, two more since then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm. Anything to add? Yeah, just that the, the requirements are so strict, just based on everything that's going on in, in the world today. Um, mm -hmm. We've got to hire them that are ethical, think quickly on their feet. Um, they have to be able to figure out legal um, arguments or decisions that Supreme Court justices will take months to decide. Right. So. And I think what's... And, a, oh, go No, I was going to say, and that also feeds into the fact that you're probably seeing less people entering into yes. the academies and maybe choosing policing yeah. as a profession because there is so yes. much risk and it's been there's I mean I, I don't know I think yeah. I think you had mentioned that as a trend I don't know well, what I think that's anecdotally actually. I can tell you criminal justice programs seem to be down numbers police departments seem to be down applicants and we think it's this national trend where Police officers do such a great job every day, and you have an incident across the country where a police officer, perhaps, we don't judge because we don't have all the facts, may have made a, a poor decision or not the best decision. Um, and they go home, you know, police officers come to work every day not knowing whether they're going to be sued by the end of the day, whether they'll be arrested for some improper action by the end of the day. And we think a lot of you, uh, young folks are saying, why do I want to get involved in a career like that? Yeah, and I, I think in the 10 years or 20 years ago, we, we know that people, when they apply for jobs, they look to their family for guidance as to what would be Absolutely. a career. Mm -hmm. 20 years ago, if you sat around the dinner table and said, I think I might want to be a police officer, the family goes, oh, that's a really good job. The benefits are, yeah. are, are pretty good. It's a good job. It's a well-respected um, profession. I'm not sure that conversation uh, occurs now. I think we picture that that conversation is, why would you want to do that now? You're mm -hmm. subject to such public scrutiny and criticism for your decisions. Uh, it's a dangerous job. Um, so one of the goals on some of the outreach is not only to identify the candidates that might want a job, but convince their family that right. this would be a good job for them also, a good career. And it is. It's an amazing career. It is, it, it is an amazing yeah. career. And, and again, most of the police officers do a great job. Mm -hmm. And some, maybe I can state it a little differently than you, but there are situations that really do look very, mm. uh, like things are happening Negatively. that shouldn't. But. Uh, Connecticut is different, yeah. and we do so much training, so, and we prepare. So what I get is people will say, Chief, what do you think of you know, that situation in you know, Minnesota? And what I, what I say is, the, the issue I have is I don't have all the facts, of course, right. but I don't know how they hire in Minnesota. I don't know their standards in Minnesota. I don't know their training in mm -hmm. Minnesota. I don't know their policies and accountability in Minnesota, so I can only speak to what we have in Connecticut. And we have a really strong model here in Connecticut for policing that seems um, to have worked and to be working. And you have talked about how you, uh, one of your um, tenants, I guess, in your primary focus is to de-escalate, mm -hmm. not escalate, right? right. That's right away sure. you always talk about. And again, being partners with the community, having the community have faith in you that you are looking mm -hmm. out for the best interests of the community. And we have a diverse community. Mm -hmm. We do. Um, and yeah. we work at that all the time to make sure that you keep your, you know, that everybody keeps... Um, conscious or unconscious yeah. biases in mm -hmm. check, yeah, you yeah, know, right. all the time. Yeah, so, If I could add, one of the reasons, and we're, recruitment's not as well as it used to be, but we're still doing fairly well, yeah. and a lot of it is the West Hartford community, mm -hmm. because it's, it, we do have that support that, that you mentioned. Uh, we have a great downtown center. It's a great community to work in. Um, so I do think in some ways, just it, the, the whole system works together. Mm -hmm. It's the reputation of West Hartford that helps us recruit, that gets us good officers, that helps us keep the reputation, along with all the other things that the town does. Right. And the other part of, of, of our outreach is also, you know, the law enforcement nationwide needs to do a better job educating the public on, mm -hmm. on what we do in our jobs, what, what our jobs entail. 
And so, you know, these different uh, programs that, that we're running here in West Hartford, we, we try to uh, allow people to, you know, become an officer for a day mm -hmm. here. And these are kind of the, the scenarios that you run through with this. These are, these are the situations, these are the, the legalities and the implications of a split second decision. And it, it helps people keep an open mind that you know, social media is so popular now and you get a, a quick few, few seconds of, something, of an incident that happens, but yet there's a whole other background to it. There, there, it's a longer video. There, uh, right. You have to gather the facts. You know, everything that you see may not be the reality. There, right. you know, from a different ang camera angle or a different person's perspective, they may have seen something that the camera doesn't pick up. Citizens we Academy, that's one mm -hmm. of the things you're talking about, where why new people sign up for a series of, of classes, yes. and mm -hmm. they are exposed to what you do mm -hmm. um, on an everyday basis. Right. And it's, it, you sort of build up to under, having them understand, understand. So they come in, they come in, we have one going on uh, running right now, it's every Wednesday night from 6 to 8.30 or 9, but it's different uh, divisions within the police department will come in, but we talk a lot about that, about the training, use of force. And in fact, as you know, we distilled it down and we had just a one night program on police use of force. It was a two and a half hour program, ended up being three hours because mm -hmm. everybody was so engaged, they wanted to stay later. We finally had to cut it at nine o'clock, but it talked about just police use of force, how we're trained, um, our policies, our procedures, our investigations, but most importantly, human dynamics, what a police officer experiences. And that's where they show the video where you had an incident with two different camera angles. And from the first angle, it looks like you, there's a little bit of question, but when you see the second uh, angle of the video, there's no question the officer did the right thing in the situation. Mm -hmm. It's important for the public to understand that. Interesting, and that is um, what we have cameras on mm -hmm. our on our dashboard, mm -hmm. but the police don't wear body cameras, body cameras. yet, yeah. right? Because okay, so some of the so all of our marked vehicles have the cameras now. So when a police officer pulls over a car, there's a recording, there's a video of mm -hmm. the incident. Um, cameras will sometimes turn on automatically, but they always go on with the lights. Mm -hmm. um, we looked at body cameras. So the concern about body cameras, and there, there's many, uh, but I'll talk specifically about West Hartford, a few things. First is uh, the cost. It's an issue, but it's not a huge issue. It's not a huge hurdle. It's the cost of equipment, then also the cost of storing Storing the, the equipment, then. right. But I think the, the biggest concerns we have, or I have as Chief West Hartford, there are two. One is um, FOI concerns because this could really bog us down with freedom of information requests. So for those who may not know, freedom of information is any document that a police department has, um, whether it's a written document, whether it's an audio, a video recording, is in most cases disclosable to the public. Uh, if somebody wanted to come in and say to us, hey, Chief, I'd like to see uh, every video you have for the past two years that involved an interaction with a minority person, that's gonna, we need somebody full-time just to do that, just to run through those videos, find the videos, find out what's disclosable, what's not disclosable. So there's really this big burden with FOI. Did you wanna, were you gonna jump in with that? Or no? no, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Second issue is privacy and community relations. So if we are recording every interaction with a citizen, mm -hmm. You know, I think that could have some um, chilling effects on some of the citizens. I, I like to give the example where most departments have a policy saying if it's a work-related encounter, you have to record. So if I have an officer who stops into Dunkin' Donuts, not that we eat donuts, but we like coffee. <laughs> right? I was okay. going to say, where's the coffee? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I don't. <laughs> um, he's in line. Somebody comes up to him and says, can I ask you a question? Sure. I'm having a problem with my neighbor. You'd have to say, well, hold on a second, turn on the camera and say, Okay, now go ahead and tell me about your problem with the neighbor. And the person might go, oh, well, that's, that's not really what I wanted. Walking into somebody's home, it's going to record the whole interior of the home and everything taking place in the home. Mm -hmm. Those are releasable to the public. So do you want an officer coming into your home, uh, recording you, your encounter, uh, the privacy of your, your life in your castle, and then that gets re released to your neighbor the next day who says, I want to see the video of the officer who was in that house. Mm -hmm. These are the right. concerns we so have. So it's more complicated than even though you, and in many instances you have said, you appreciate having the video of sure. the exchange in a, mm -hmm. in a situation because it, it holds up the facts. But there's a lot, a lot of more unintended it, yeah. uh, potential consequences yeah. that you can't reel back once exactly. you... Exactly. The point is, no one's opposed to cameras. Cameras are a right. good thing. They're a great tool. Actually, we're probably recording 80 or 85 percent of the patrol interactions now, um, and we're going to get cameras someday. That's it's just that it. we're it's a, yeah. it is a big expense. 
it's trying to figure out how to store it, download it, keep it. Um, and honestly, right now, I don't think that the, the regulations and the laws have caught up to the technology, mm -hmm. kind of like drones, right. is it's here. So we're yep. taking the cautious approach. We feel very confident that with the cruiser cameras, that I actually do the audio of an officer's inside a house, we still record that, um, that that for right now should assure the public that we're able to watch what's going on. There's that transparency mm -hmm. if they need to see it. But yet we're not jumping ahead in, in stuff or in equipment that's going to be a lot of money, maybe subject to change. And the, the regulations just need to be right. more yeah. mature. Yeah. I guess. So I just want to highlight a point too, though. So when with our in-car cameras, it's a watch guard system. That's a manufacturer. Mm -hmm. We have the whole um, architecture set up for that, the infrastructure. Uh, what we like to do is when WatchGuard comes out with their body cameras, it'll work with that whole infrastructure we have, so it reduces the cost. We'll test and evaluate a couple of those and check on some of these um, concerns that we have and see if it's going to be a good fit for West Hartford. So we're, I'm not saying by any means we're not going to get them. Right, I don't think they're right, the right but thing. It's premature. It's, it's premature at this point. You, right. you want to do it the right way. The right when way. you do right. it, you want to do it the right way. Exactly. So that we always want to be approachable. We don't want to lose that with the community. Right. As and I have said, we don't do things quickly, but we do them right. We just start from there. So anyway, and changes along the way. Um, we we don't have too much time left as we spent, but I just want to talk about school safety and okay. sort of what mm -hmm. you are doing. Obviously, after Sandy Hook, so much changed, and uh, yeah. and we were doing a lot already. We were. But uh, what? It's what changes a lot. Yeah. Do you want? So the, we, we spend a whole half hour talking <laughs> yeah, about that. I know, There's I know. So much Just to say. when maybe you'll come what, back. What we, what we can say is that um, prior to Sandy Hook, I think police departments had a different approach to how they would handle an active shooter situation. Since then, we've really re-examined it. And when we have, if, if a department across the country now, and this is pretty standard, has an active shooter situation, officers are going to make immediate entry into the school to stop the threat. Um, that's the short version there. Mm -hmm. Since then, though, we've, uh, we've done active shooter drills at our schools. We've done lockdown drills at our schools. Uh, we work very closely with the superintendent's office and mm -hmm. school security. They have Eric Densey, who's new security director, mm -hmm. has been great to work with. Um, we've done walkthroughs of the schools. I mean, there's, there's just so much we've done. It's almost hard to encapsulate it into a, a, no, a quick yeah. answer. Yeah, no, there's an officer assigned to each high school. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three community relations officers that rotate through the school. What we like about that program is they're not just uh, there for security. Those officers actually teach classes. They become part of the community. They're mentors. They've helped us with recruitment processes. Yes. I was going to say um, it's similar to the outreach you do with the public in a, the school community right. where mm -hmm. you those resource officers are part of that yeah. school community, right? right. right. So if there's a concern that a staff member mm -hmm. has, they have that ongoing communication, the officers actually can kind of keep an eye on things. And, right? and our history goes back to the late 60s with uh, police officers in the schools. So what's nice now is as we come with new techniques and equipment and a greater police presence, the students just accept it because they're part of the community. Right. I mean, we're teaching them in kindergarten and first grade about how to walk to school safely. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So uh, the, the, we build a really good rapport. And with that them. first interaction with the police officers, this this kind of more pleasant one, just mm -hmm. kind of norms it out. They see them as a mentor and role model, we hope. It's not a negative interaction, which is great exposure from young age on up. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. been a great program for us. And so the public knows, we, we have officers all over town mm -hmm. during the daytime. Mm -hmm. they're, they're everywhere. You. you have problems going around a corner and bumping into a, a police mm -hmm. cruiser. But we also have them out in unmarked cars as well. Mm -hmm. And we've had, I think, uh, maybe two false alarms where the, an alarm came in and we had to respond to a school. And we had a police officer on the ground at the school in under a minute mm -hmm. on, on each of those, those cases that we dealt with. And um, to, to get information to us, to, and we immediately determined, oh, this is a false alarm. But the, the response is amazing in West yeah. Hartford. Yeah, and that's what we rely on you Wait. for that. Mm -hmm. And you do a great job oh, at responding to <clears throat> those emergency situations and the non-emergency right. situations. Um, just quickly before we have to go, crime trends, what should people be <laughs> aware cars, of? And, yeah. you know, and sort of. So really quickly, um, there's FBI breaks crimes on the crimes against person, crimes against property. In crimes against person, we're below the national and the state average. We do very well there. Crimes against property, we're below the national average. We're a little bit above the state average. A lot of that has to do with the fact that <clears throat> we have a lot of, um, we've had a lot of car, the uh, car thefts and car breaks over the past several months. Not just in West Hartford, but the entire region is experiencing this. So what we like to, and this is a matter of 
um, overnight. Juveniles typically mm -hmm. um, checking cars if they're unlocked. It's like it's like a, a, a slot machine. Mm -hmm. If the car is unlocked, they go and get what they can. They win. If it's locked, they move on to the next house. So our big message uh, to residents is to lock your cars, take your valuables out of your cars, hide your valuables. Don't leave your car keys. We have residents that will leave the car keys um, in the ignition or in the cup holder. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. You make yourself an easy victim. It's called target hardening. If we could reduce that, I know that our crimes against property rate would drop significantly yeah uh, if somebody comes to your door and says they're from mdc or the mm -hmm. gas company call us um the, the odds are that it's probably somebody um trying to sneak into the house uh, usually if we have that kind of a situation there'll be notice to the neighbors we're going notice, to be at your yeah. house or they, so don't right right and where then, you had called and made an appointment and right. they're there but there's there's if there's a gas leak in the area there's going to be fire trucks and police mm -hmm. cars mm -hmm. yeah as we roll into the winter time uh, two other thing, quick things. Motion lights are always a wonderful thing mm -hmm. to have. Mm -hmm. And also, if you're going away on vacation, make sure your driveway is getting shoveled or plowed so That's it looks like someone's point. living there. And your sidewalks, too, because... Yes. Your sidewalks. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sidewalks, <laughs> sidewalks, sidewalks, sidewalks. Yeah, absolutely. So, again, it's been... We are so proud of the work you do. <clears throat> you, are our, you are the pride of West Hartford, no question. Um, uh, with great leadership and the three of you are critical in that. And we do have to say that, I like to say that we're the face of the department, but it's yeah. the officers that we hire that do the hard work, the dedication that are out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's the ones that do the hard work. We come up with kind of the ideas and they do the mission and they do and a great they job. they do and we meet them all the time and mm -hmm. I, anecdotal stories of all the things they do for our community uh, every day and so we're very, very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you. So, right. Thank you. I hope you will tune in next time uh, to hear about things that are happening in your town. Thank you so much for joining us.